ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our biology practical lesson for A-level students. And we are looking at the section of the toad, and we are actually in lesson six already. And in this lesson, we are going to look at majorly the digestive system of the toad or frog, but we shall also look at some of the internal uh, anatomy of the toad, including the visceral structures. So I want you to uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel for similar content that may interest you in academics. So I want to thank you for attending this lesson and uh, welcome you to journey with me as we continue with dissection of the toad. And basically we are looking at the digestive what? System. So uh, when you look at the digestive system, we are basically looking at what we call the alimentary canal and the associated organs. So when you look at the alimentary canal, we are looking at the mouth, the buccal cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, the duodenum, ileum, rectum, among other parts. So this is basically, these are parts through which the food passes through. Yeah, during the movement of the food, areas where the food passes in your body is what we have described as the alimentary canal. And then the associated structures include the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder. Those are structures that also contribute to the digestion of the food, either by secreting chemicals or otherwise. So when you combine the alimentary canal together with the associated structures, then we form what we call the digestive system. So let's start with looking at some of the parts of the digestive system, and we want to start with the mouth. So when you look at the mouth, uh, critically we can describe uh, the mouth as being terminal, as uh, being very wide, actually extending towards the tympanic membrane. Literally, we would say that the mouth runs from ear to ear, simply because it runs from one tympanic membrane almost to the other. So it's uh, therefore a very wide uh, structure there. But that uh, wide structure of the mouth has a biological significance. And uh, the significance is that it provides a wide gap for ingestion of large prey uh, and food. So during the, when the mouth is big, it means you can ingest, you can take in prey of large size. You can take in a very large grasshopper or a very large uh, organism as food. So that is the advantage of having a large mouth. And then still in the mouth, it has numerous maxillary teeth, which are uniform. Uniform meaning they are of the same size and same shape. Okay. And they are small. They are pointed. And then they are, they are conical shaped and they are curving backwards. The advantage of curving backward is because it prevents, it enables to increase friction to prevent the prey from escaping. In case it has swallowed the prey which is living and which, which is actually in most cases is what happens. These frogs and toads swallow living prey. For example, they swallow the grasshoppers, other insects and so on, which are alive. And the, the prey, it stands a risk of losing the prey if the maxillary teeth were not there. So the maxillary teeth are pointed backwards so as to prevent the prey from what? Escaping from the mouth, the large mouth. And then the internal roof, the upper part of the mouth, the inner part has nares. One is called the nares, through which air enters the buccal cavity. They are too small, they are two in number, they are small, they are rounded, and they have valves. These nerves are external, they are internal nerves we are talking about. We also have the external nerves that we looked at in the external anatomy, you remember. So these are uh, nostrils, and they are connected. Just like in man, you, you realize that your nose is connected to the mouth at some point. Yes, so you can actually pass mucus from the nose to the mouth, and vice versa. And air can also pass 
along the mouth to the nose and vice versa. So it's the same story which happens in the cases of the toad and the frog. Yeah. And then we have the vomerine teeth, which are usually larger in size and fewer in number. And they are usually located on the roof of the buccal cavity. And they are also used for uh, holding the prey tight during the swallowing process. And then, uh, so we can see the internal structures there of the mouth, the, 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 the floor and the roof of the buccal cavities. You can see the structures. Sometimes you, they, you can be told to describe the structures on the floor of the buccal cavity, meaning the lower part of the buccal cavity, or the roof, the roof of the buccal cavity. That is the upper part. So from there, I think you can be able to identify some of the structures that are found on the floor and on the roof of the buccal cavity. So we can look at some few that at least we are familiar with. We start from the roof, the floor of the buccal cavity going clockwise. You can see there the lower jaw and then you have the, the floor of the buccal cavity that extent there, that large part. Then we have the opening of the vocal, the vocal sac that is actually where the sound is produced from. You've heard the, these frogs making noise at night, making sounds, yeah? So that sound always comes from the, those vocal sacs. They contain air spaces, and they are well modified with the valves to produce sound. Uh, they are like voice boxes. And then we have the gullet there. Uh, and then we have the angle of uh, jaw opening. That is the joint where the upper and the lower jaw join and they are flexible it can open and close then we have the roof of the buccal cavity there the vomerine teeth you can see and then we have the upper jaw which usually has the maxillary teeth and then we have we continue and look at the the internal layers as you can see that there are two uh, the maxillary teeth i told you earlier the inbulging of the eyeballs those eyeballs have the inbulging inside and that inbulging sometimes is very important, especially during swallowing of the food. When the eyes are closed from outside, they bulge a lot inside. And that inbulging helps to push the prey into the gullet and is swallowed. Then we have the glottis, which is also an opening and uh, access to the respiratory system, the lungs. Then we have the pharynx, the tongue there, which is attached at the prelingual tubercles. So you can see there, the tongue is attached at the fore, the fore part of the lower buccal cavity so that the, the other part is free to flip out to catch the prey, the way we described it during uh, the external anatomy. So let's proceed to look at now the two-dimensional drawing there. As you can see, much more precise. Of course, some of the parts may not be able, you may not be able to see clearly, but at least what is named there is what at least you can see uh, much more clearly. The maxillary teeth are represented there. And the upper jaw, the internal nares, the vomerine teeth, you can see there. The eyeballs, the inbulging of the eyeballs. Then we have the station tubes. Those station tubes are usually connected to the tympanic membrane and they are part of the hearing system. But particularly their role is they contribute in the process of balance during movement. And then we have the opening of the esophagus. That is the, in, the inlet to the inner part of the digestive system or the alimentary canal. And then we have the vocal sacs and then the tongue there. So those are some of the visible parts that you can see when the mouth is open. And when you catch your specimen, you can open the mouth and try to see some of those parts and locate them. What is very important is for you to know their location, their relative location to other parts, so and their relative sizes as well. As you can see from there, the, the tongue is the largest, the inbulging of the eyeballs, and then the esophagus, the station tubes, the vomerine teeth. So others are smaller, others are large. So when you are drawing, you be mindful to represent this parts correctly. So you can draw that diagram, you can make that drawing in your book, usually 
it will be good to use a book with plain papers. That's when it will come out clearly. Draw it and then send me your drawing. I want to see how you are progressing. So you can make that drawing and send me a copy. Take a photo and send it to me. And then we, we can comment accordingly. You can even make a better one. This one is scanned. It may not be so clear. But yours can be clearer than that. And then, uh, if you cut along the mouth, the side of the mouth, the side of the jaw, the joints of the jaws, the upper and the lower jaw, and you cut through them, and then you open, you can be able to expose a structure which looks like that, such that now you have separate floor and the roof of the buccal cavities. You open them up. And then sometimes you can be told to illustrate, to draw it, and show the structures which are there. Are you able to, to show structures which are found at the roof of the buccal cavity? What about those at the floor of the buccal cavity? Are you able to see them? Yes. So you can do that and also draw. And then send me your drawing. I want to see how beautiful that drawing would be. And you can see that the, the floor of the buccal cavity has the tongue and part of the glottis. And then the roof of the buccal cavity has most of the parts, as you can see there. The maxillary teeth, the internal nares, the, of course many are called nares, the vomerine teeth, the eyeballs, in bulging of the eyeballs, the station tubes. So those are some of the parts that you can see from the, the roof of the buccal cavity. So when you are drawing, make sure you are very neat uh, and you can ensure that by using a very sharp pencil. Let's proceed then to the visceral organs. What are the visceral organs, members? This word is common. Whenever they tell you what are the visceral organs. So the visceral organs, are, viscera is the word which is collectively used to mean the internal organs of the body in the abdomen and the thoracic cavities. So when you talk about the visceral organs of a toad or a frog, we are talking about organs or structures that can easily be visible after you have opened the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. Whatever, after opening the skin, what you see on the thoracic and the abdominal cavity are called the visceral organs. However, you can be, you can be directed to draw whatever the examiner may want. He can tell you, draw the visceral organs in the thoracic region or the abdominal region. So you should be able to identify which ones are on the abdominal region and which ones are on the thoracic what? region. What about if we say the viscera in situ? What do we mean? Viscera in situ means the visceral organs in their original state, in the undisturbed state. If this, after opening the visceral organs, you have not displaced them or opened them up or displaced them to one direction or pulled them up or down or sideways, in the very way they are, that one is called viscera in situ, the undisturbed state of the visceral organs. And we are going to look at it here. After you have opened your toad or frog, those are the organs you should be able to see. And those are the visceral organs. We are going to name some of them. We have the heart there in the center. And it's associated to its structures there. The truncus arteriosus. That word is arteriosus. The S-U-S, -S, the, the, the suffix S-U-S, -S, not S-I-S. Although some books show S-I-S, -S, but it's the truncus arteriosus. Then we have the auricles there, or the atria. We have the right atrium, and then we have the left atrium. Those are the chambers of the heart. And then, of course, the heart of the amphibians only has one ventricle. So there are three chambers in the heart of the amphibian. One ventricle and two atria. And then we have uh, the liver has lobes, usually. Three are very visible. You can see the left lobe, the median lobe, and then we have the right lobe of the liver. And of course, we know the liver is very large and covers most of the entire part of the thorax and part of the abdomen. So it is a very visible structure. It will be very sad if they told you to draw visceral structures 
and you ignore the liver. Seriously, the liver is very large, too large to be ignored. And then we have the ventral abdominal vein there. Usually we'll ligature that vein as we, as we are dissecting. But in this drawing, I wanted to show you its direction and its position, its origin and its location. But during dissection, we usually ligature it. And uh, we'll show you how the, that is done when we are dissecting. And then we have the stomach there on the left of the animal, left center. Uh, we have the stomach, you can see properly. We have the large intestines there, can be seen. The urinary bladder, the small intestines. Those are the structures of the viscera in situ. After opening the toad, what you see in the undisturbed state looks like that. Then after which you can continue to open, based on the instructions that are given to you by the examiner or by the teacher. But the viscera in situ, those are the structures that you will be able to clearly see. Sometimes the fats may be many, or if it is a female, the eggs may have occupied most of those parts. So you can remove the eggs, you can also remove the fats, then the other structures can remain. But you, as you remove them, take care, not, don't damage other parts. So let's proceed. Uh, the viscera in situ can be drawn like that. You can be told to draw viscera in situ. And that is how it will appear there. You have seen some of the parts, the heart and its chambers, the gallbladder there, the liver, the duodenum, the ileum, the rectum, the bladder. So those are the parts there. You can even draw a much more clear, clear one than that. So I want you to practice to draw viscera in situ and then send me your drawings. Draw viscera in situ of the toad or frog and send me that drawing. I would like to see how you have drawn and then we discuss together. And then uh, when, you, when you now continue exposing after looking at the in situ, you expose your animal, you remove some of the fat layers, you displace uh, the digestive system a little bit, then you, you disturb it now. It's no longer in situ. It will appear like that. I'm interested in you identifying, concreti concretizing with the, the location and the names of the structures there. Uh, you can see some of the structures there. We have displaced the liver and the heart. But at least you can see the liver, the lobes of the liver, the stomach location there. Now you can see even the pancreas at that point. The bladder is much more visible. The large intestines, the cloaca can be seen. And other additional parts have been added there. Just to enable you to learn more about the anatomy of the toad there. Remember, this one is three-dimensional. It shows more of picture-like structure to show you more detail. However, when you are told to draw, you do not draw a three-dimensional structure. We are going to show you how uh, to draw a two-dimensional structure later on. So that is still our drawing, our three-dimensional structure there. So let's proceed and look at the digestive system much more. Remember, we had started with the mouth, and we talked about it as a terminal structure, which is very wide and uh, located in front of the body, of the head and running from almost tympanic membrane to tympanic membrane, very wide like that, and we saw the internal structures. We also proceeded and looked at the, the viscera in situ. So now we want to continue with the digestive system more. We have a part called the oesophagus. So this part is usually short for the toad and the frog, and it is narrow, but it is tubular. It is tubular, it is muscular, and it has longitudinal folds which close entry of air into the stomach. So it has some sort of valves that close as the food is swallowed. You can even do this, even in man it has. When you are swallowing saliva, uh -huh, you feel that there is a closing and opening. So this oesophagus has that powerful muscle that can allow opening and closing, but it can also allow expansion and contraction. Uh, then we have the stomach. The stomach is elongated, 
and thick walled and it is, has a very thick wall internally. It is folded longitudinally to allow distension and increase in surface area to, for secretion of gastric juice. So the stomach uh, is uh, muscular and can allow expansion. That's why when you are eating, the stomach increases. When you are hungry, it reduces. So it, has, it can allow expansion and uh, contraction. Similarly, for the toad, the same story. And can also, the infolding is increasing surface area for secretion of what? The gastric juice, which has enzymes that facilitate the process of digestion. And then it has two constrictions. Uh, the entry to the stomach has what we call the cardiac sphincter muscle, which controls the entry of food. And then the exit of the stomach has what we call the pyloric sphincter that controls exit of the food. So the food just does not just pour into the mouth, uh, into the stomach. It is controlled. Its entry is controlled so that it enters in the bits and also exits in the bits. And then we have the pancreas, which is always a cream colored or yellowish fatty-like structure that lives in the mesentery between the stomach and the duodenum. So when you are following your anatomy from the stomach as you move towards the duodenum, in between there, there is uh, a creamy structure there like fats or that we call the pancreas. And of course the pancreas is one of the associated structures of the digestive system. Then we have the gallbladder which is oval shaped sac lying between the main lobes of the liver and has a bile duct as in its outlet. That bile duct, the gallbladder stores the bile, which of course we know is good for emulsification of fats. Then we have the ileum, which is usually very long and coiled. It is narrow, tubular, with thin walls. It's usually where absorption takes place. It also secretes some enzymes. Then we have the rectum, which is short, thick-walled, enlarged, and it's wide, and it's between the colon and the cloaca, and it's used for temporary storage of wastes before elimination. So before elimination of wastes, it is stored in the rectum tentatively, just like even in man, the same story there. So we want to thank you very much for following this lesson. I'm going to share with you more structures of the digestive system and alimentary canal so that you appreciate more and more. But most important is for you to learn their location, uh, their function, and then their structure, how they look like, and most important, their spelling as well. So you do continue practicing to draw these different structures of the alimentary canal and digestive system. When you draw, you will be able to know how they are related, which one connects with the other, so you, I want you to continue manipulating them, drawing, mastering them. You can use dissection guides to master this information more so that you are more competent with the knowledge and then you can be able to apply it in the questions in case they are asked. For now, I want to thank you very much for being good students and I want to encourage you to continue staying at home and staying safe until it is safer for you to return back to school. Thank you very much. Bye.